Good evening and welcome to Echini Live. I'm Kwezi Bovula. These are your headlines at the top of the hour. After 21 years, SciFest Africa has raised questions about accessibility. Is enough awareness for Israeli Apartheid Week being raised at Rhodes University? International students express dissatisfaction with paying late registration fees due to delayed visas. Rhodes Rugby unsuccessful in the Varsity Shield Cup. 21 years ago, the first SciFest Africa took place. The festival started out as an afternoon in the City Hall. Today, the festival hosts with more than 50,000 guests. However, is SciFest accessible to Grahamstown East school learners? After 21 years of SciFest Africa, why are 56,000 people still choosing to travel to Grahamstown's 1820 Settlers Monument for the Science, Maths and Engineering Festival? At school you might find it's a very intimidating environment because you, your introduction to maths and science is not that simple. It's not, it's not made easy. It's that, you know, there's disruptions to it that you have no control over. Whereas you can come here and play to your heart's content and really um, experience science on a very personal level and in a way that will give you an attachment to it and give you an experience of it that you might not otherwise have had. Former Nombulelo High School learner Nolu Vyoshwembe is now a chemistry teacher at Gadra. She speaks about the impact of SciFest Africa on learners in her community. I do think SciFest is, is important um, because it exposes kids, especially primary kids, to a lot of experiments and, and things like the laser show, which gets them very, very excited. Because I myself, you know, was one of those kids who got excited by those shows. The festival is a project of the Graham Sound Foundation. It was opened by Minister of Science and Technology, Nale Dipando, on the 8th of March and ran for seven days. Visitors interacted with 65 exhibitions, viewed 18 lectures, with a total of 706 events. The program was jam-packed, including a laser show, film festival, science cafe, educational theatre and virtual shows. It won't eat us. SciFest Africa may have turned 21, but has it come of age? The distance between the town and the monument and the costs involved in attending the events raise questions about the accessibility of the festival to the Gramstown community. The monument and the Gramstown Foundation has a huge effect on our local community because it provides, you know, literally thousands of jobs um, through all the festivals that come out of this building. A very large part of our public are young, and there is their schoolgoers and their students. And you're quite correct when you say that our, our maths and science education is in crisis. It really, really is. And and I think that learners today, in you know, so many schools in this country are at a huge disadvantage. For some kids, the festival will, festival will be enough. For others, the truth is, it won't be enough. The resources in terms of chemicals in schools and as well as allowing kids to be able to work with these chemicals and see these things that you are teaching them in class in practice is lacking in most, if I should say, township schools. We absolutely keep in mind the children who are in schools that are poorly resourced in maths and science. And, and really what SciFest does is it's, it's designed to spark curiosity in people, in all people of all ages. Another SciFest Africa draws to a close as the Gramstown community settles back into its everyday routine. Is it a community more knowledgeable and inspired, or must they wait until 2018 for another eight days of science engagement? This is Annelisa Sander reporting for Rhodes TV at the 1820 Settlers Monument, Gramstown. Each year, South Africans participate in Israeli Apartheid Week to raise awareness and stand in solidarity with Palestinians. At Rhodes University, participation among the student body has declined. Why is this? We investigate. In light of Israeli Apartheid Week, Echini Live looked at the importance of international solidarity and the role South African universities play in the Palestinian liberation struggle. Professor Farid Isak spoke on why academic boycotts are vital to the movement. The immediate affinity with the uh, struggle of the Palestinians, it is felt uh, in South Africa very palpably. Firstly, because of our own experience as a people who have lived, uh, suffered and died under apartheid. This on the one hand, 
And on the other hand, uh, memories that we sometimes are prepared to forgive, but not that easily forget. In the University of Johannesburg, as you point out, uh, decided to cut off ties with Ben-Gurion University in the Negev because Ben-Gurion University uh, is actively complicit uh, inside, uh, inside apartheid Israel. While student participation at Rhodes seemed poor in comparison to other universities, Wesley Seal assured it would pick up in coming years as the movement has always been supported on this campus. A campus such as WITS, you have a strong Jewish community and a strong uh, Muslim community in Johannesburg itself, never mind that. So the Israeli-Palestine thing, while we don't want to make it a religious thing, and it's not a religious struggle, um, of course has very ardent supporters in there. Comrades, I want to ask you to prevent engaging with private security. It ties in with the question of what happened a couple of years ago at Rhodes. I think it became very heated at Rhodes, and the ability of Rhodes, certainly because of Grahamstown, of where it is, the location, it has the ability to cool down. It's always the campus in all of the, in the country, we saw this with Fees Must Fall, to always be late on protests. But now we're picking up on it again. And I, 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 I'm, cert, I'm almost certain that in a couple of years' time again, in a year or two's time, if not as soon as next year, that it will become heated again because it is a very heated discussion. Yusuf Vahid, a member of the Muslim Students Association at Rhodes, stressed the importance of international solidarity, empathy, and standing up in the fight for human rights. I've been there three times, and, and the Israeli forces and the Zionist government don't want people to enter Israel is because once you enter, you can see what is happening and the atrocities taking place and the occupation. One thing is hearing about it and one thing is visually seeing it. And that has a greater impact on people's hearts. So I encourage people from across the world, whether you are Christian, whether you are Muslim, whether whatever faith you follow, visit this place and observe what is happening in Palestine and observe the, 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 the occupation. Basically, the, the message from the Palestinians when I went there is that financial aid is important, we all know that. But one thing more they wanted is that they explained to us, whoever you spoke to, when you go back to your country, wherever you may be from, whether you're the UK, whether South Africa, tell people what is happening in, in uh, Palestine. To stand up for Palestine, you do not need to be Muslim. You just need to be human uh, uh, because these are human rights that have been violated. As the week comes to an end, students, academics and activists stood in solidarity by holding a demonstration in light of Israeli Apartheid Week. Rhodes University international students are unhappy with the delay in documents required for a visa. Students are meant to receive an acceptance letter by the beginning of the year. Deepa Kesa spoke to a few international students who are frustrated with the system. Due to the late arrival of a Rhodes University approval letter and after a fine of 1,300 rand, international students are left feeling marginalized. It's unfair because... Um, considering that we, there is another, I think it's 8,100 international levy that we pay that we don't really know what it does, um, then having to pay another 1.3 on top of that is, especially for visa delays, is, I think probably should be included in that 8.1. International students also, their families face financial constraints as well, maybe can't pay fees in time. These are common issues, you do find, however, it makes the extra charge makes it seem like the international student and their family are intentionally uh, go, I mean, intentionally putting themselves through these stresses and they deserve to be paying this extra 1,300 rands because they're just being irresponsible or something else unfair like that. Sometimes these visa delays also not only disrupt the student like in terms of academics but then also when it comes to like getting an air ticket issued or maybe getting a place to live in so then they should consider all these other aspects rather than think maybe it's uh, a student just practically getting late to come to school. Due to visa delays international students are always left with this problem. We spoke to SRC's international rep to get clarity on this issue. Well there's still people registering late now and I think the hard thing with giving the exact figures is because the cases come in one by one where someone will email and say, I'm waiting for my proof of payment to come through or the transfer hasn't come through or my visa is supposed to come through the next few days. So it's 
not an exact figure. We don't have a total figure because not everyone is coming through us as well. Some people are going straight to the rest of the division, so I wouldn't know the exact figure. Rhodes TV spoke to Sharon Tala, who was directly affected by visa delays and a late approval letter, which resulted in her paying the fine. The reason why I couldn't just come or I couldn't just apply for my visa is because one of the requirements for a visa is a letter of approval. I applied for my visa and it took about a week, so that's why I came late. I only received it once the first week of school had started. And I tried contacting even the VC and no response up to this day. I truly believe it's the school's fault. It was no, there was nothing else I could do. I had everything else ready for my application apart from that letter. Graham Maruta has the following suggestions for this problem. I'd suggest that people start the whole renewal process in advance because what happens is at times one will wait for their supplementary exams results, for example, right, until they start um, the whole visa renewal process. I'm Deepa Kessa, reporting for RUTV, Grahamstown. Our reporter tried to contact the administration manager and they were unavailable for comment. After the break, we have Nondogo Zomkunu with your sports news. Good evening, I'm Nondogo Zamkunu with the Sports News. After five years of not qualifying for the Varsity Shield Cup, Rhodes Rugby finally made their debut. Their journey in the tournament was short-lived with the Rhodes team constantly losing. While the losses were disappointing, the Rhodes community continues to back the Borgies. It's been a, a, a wonderful journey, you know, um, from seeing our players you know, wearing varsity shield, or varsity cup clothing, from coming to Greatfield and have and see it packed, you know, with students wearing purple vests, you know, from seeing our mascots and professor at Greatfield, you know, from welcoming, you know, a varsity shield and varsity cup graduates here. It's been an amazing journey. The Rhodes rugby captain Jonathan Bronze comments on their journey. Oh, well, I think it's been um it's been a very like memorable um, time for the team. Uh, obviously, being the first Rhodes team in Varsity Shield, um, yeah, it's, it's it's been very special for us. Um, obviously, things haven't gone quite according to plan with our results so far, but we're pretty confident that we can turn things around. practiced really hard for their match against Walter Sisulu University and there was a very good turnout of supporters. The boys were very fierce and ready to tackle Walter Sisulu University. With the rugby match between Rhodes University and Walter Sisulu University and the crowd seems to be responding very well, the score is currently 16-10 to Walter Sisulu University and both teams seem to be fighting for the winning position. After the opening try by Rose University, tables turned very quickly when Walter Sisulu scored during the first half of the match. By the end of the second half, Walter Sisulu won 45-15. Supporters share their opinion on the match. They tried their best, but like the performance was disappointing. Eh? They could do better if they like. They should actually like start from the beginning. I mean, go back to the drawing board, discuss their tactics and shit and everything. Cause like they failing right now. Like it's been what the past two games losses, I think. So like it's not working out. Whatever they're doing, like yeah, that's what I have to say. The boys uh, played, tried to play the first half and everything, uh, but they lost. Uh, hard luck to the boys again, uh, so better luck next time. But the game was okay during the first half, and then, yeah, things happened. Second half, we also did the things, and yeah. yeah so We'll continue to support the boykies. In studio, we have Leon Soms, a Girl Cards male sports journalist. Good evening, Leon. Good evening. Leon. Mm -hmm. The rugby um, team recently lost their varsity shield game against the University of Guazulu Natal. What do you think is the possible reason for these constant losses? Um, I, think, I think that there are many factors behind this. For a start, obviously, 
Rhodes is a small university. A lot of the universities we've played against are a lot bigger. Um, I think that also um, we don't give out sports bursaries. Mm. And a lot, of, a lot of the players we've come up against are very, very talented. And they would have been attracted to other universities as opposed to us. For example, when we played against the University of Fort Hare, uh, they had Samila Joe in their team. He's played Curry Cup for EP Kings before. Mm. Um, so I think it's difficult to compete against players like that when you're at a small university, you're not handing out bursaries. The last factor, I think, is that this has just come at an uncomfortable time for us. Yeah. Ev every now and then, a sp any sports team will go through a transition period. Yeah. And that's what Rhodes are in now. Um, the coach, Kondo Kele Sampondo, he's built the team around players like Marcus Nell, Jürgen Strubel over the last few years. They're gone now, and he started out again with a young team. Yeah. Is there any possibility of um, the Rhodes rugby team actually winning the Varsity Shield Cup. But I also think this question brings back another question of, is it possible for them to make it into the next season of Varsity Shield? Uh, well, we, we certainly will be back next season, but um, I don't see us winning it in the foreseeable future. Certainly, though, there, there's definitely potential for improvement. All right. Thank you very much, Leon, for your time. Thank you. Audio in more sports news... The Rhodes Volleyball Club will be participating in the Flying Fish Beach Volleyball Tournament from the 6th to the 8th of April at the Great Field. The club encourages all Rhodes students to attend and support the event. That's it for your sports news. Back to you, Crazy. Coming up next, we will be having a studio discussion about the increase in cases of sexual violence at Rhodes University and the re-emergence of the hashtag Are You Reference List. But before we get to that, here's something to do on a Sunday, celebrating blackness and nostalgic Afro-pop jams, Slow Sunday, a relaxed event to unwind and de-stress as the latest event on the Graham Sound social scene. Hannah Chibayambuya reports. I'm Hannah Shibayambria, here at 37 on you for Slow Sunday. We're here, it's going to be filled with food, fun and people. Come along, let's check it out. <laughs> we sat down with the co-founder of Slow Sunday, Blessings Chinganga, to find out more about the event and discuss the underlying issues South African black youth are facing in this period of transformation. Um, I just wanted to know, what inspired you to create this event? So it was last year and Spokazi and I, she's the other co-founder, the three of us. It's Spokazi Mate, Liabona Nkubevana and myself. And we were just talking about how there was a lack of a space where people could just come and sit and there's Afro jazz and Afro pop playing and there's food and there's a chisanyama, that type of vibe. We just felt like it really, it wasn't there, specifically the genre, the Afro pop and the Afro jazz. We felt like it was really lacking. What inspired the music choice? It's something that we felt that people listen to on a Sunday afternoon. It's really like loungy without being, you know, something that puts you to sleep. Mm. And it also just reminded us of like family and being together. It's, it's a celebration, you know. And we particularly wanted it to be a celebration of blackness as well because we wanted to have not just a once-off event that happens, you know, maybe once a year or twice a year, but something that happens regularly where people can feel free, particularly black people can feel free to come and, you know, just relax. Obviously, everybody is welcome, but we just wanted to create that space. How do you intend to really welcome the outside Graham Sound community to this event? So the way that we're doing it is that every edition of Slow Sunday that we do is going to have a bit of a different theme. So we all operate on three kind of premises. The first one is the food, the second one is drinks and drink specials, and the third one is aesthetic, something to look at. So for this one, we have the bottles, that those are our main aesthetic. We have ones hanging up, and then we have ones that are the centerpieces. But then we wanted to do a photography edition for the next one. So we're going to invite local photographers, and we're already speaking to photographers from the Eastern, from around the Eastern Cape to come and have like an exhibition type thing. We asked people about the relevance of this event in light of South Africa's political climate. I think it's a great way to de-stress, but still get to talk about contemporary issues in a nicer setting. It's like a, a healing space without it being a poster of a healing space. So. I think it's very um, forward. 
it in terms of creating a safe space for queer people, um, people that don't necessarily um, fit the, the typical um, gender norms and, you know, heterosexual, like, heteronormative type of aesthetic. I like it when we're, we're, we're including Grahamstown as a whole because it's not, I don't feel it when we're closing ourselves in as roads. This is South Africa and we need to bring everyone within. This is a trigger warning for our sensitive viewers. The following content is about sexual violence. The release of a list of alleged sexual perpetrators in 2016 sparked a protest against sexual violence at Rhodes University. Rhodes University management put together a task team. Nearly a year later, a new list was released by students on the UCAS student body page on Facebook. The library area at Rhodes is currently plastered with posters about sexual violence. In studio today, we have Dr. Lindsay Kelland and Sikona Nazo, who will be speaking to us about the issue. Sikona, um, a new list has re-emerged this year, and it's called hashtag Are You Reference List 2.0. What do you think is different about this year's campaign in comparison to the last one? So I think this year's um protest or campaign is more about um, management actually not doing anything when we already had a protest like last year um, and you think and how they promised that they would and they would um, attend to all these issues that we had raised last year and uh, it, almost exactly a year later we're still facing almost the same issues. And what do you think actually sparked the re-emergence of the list if you were to just you know so um, obviously, amongst like ourselves, we'd have like as as well. I know in like my circles and people that like I talk to a lot, um, we'd have conversations about like what because last year there was an et al on the Ori reference list, mm -hmm. so we talk about like what that at that et al actually means, and that means that there's actually more names on that list, and how um, people haven't actually come forward, and how we know um, that they're. There's so many people that haven't been outed and how um, the costs of actually coming out are really high for survivors and victims of sexual assault. So I think because those conversations have been happening since last year. But what I think sparked the list to be posted, um, particularly at that point, was um, I think it was like a week before there was a post on, on Facebook about some form of attack. And then the warden had said that it was an attempted sexual assault, but I think she got the information wrong. I'm not too sure the exact details about that, but I remember that there was a post and then someone then posted it on Facebook. And then um, someone made a post being like a, um, a year later and we, can't, we still can't out um, um, rapists or, or perpetrators of sexual assault. And a lot of these um, rapists and like perpetrators are actually in movements like FMF with us and it's very difficult to out them because of the social capital that they that they have mm -hmm. so um, so it was very interesting because that like sparked a lot of conversation and immediately I think it was a couple of days later that list was posted and I know um, a couple of the people that are are indeed people that are um, in the movement and were arrested like during FMF and so yeah, I think that's what sparked the um, the conversation again. Um, Dr. Lindsay Kelland, um, last year women protested by trying to reclaim their bodies and to be heard by management. And do you think management actually heard their outcries? Um, I think the the short answer is no. Um, I think this is a this is a kind of the precisely the kind of problem that is silencing, right? Um, and not only silencing at the time, but silencing in the aftermath as well. I mean, people don't want to talk about yeah. sexual violence. They don't want to hear about sexual violence. So when when survivors or victims come forward and try and be heard, they're often silenced again, right? And I feel like there were various ways last year in which the the students who were protesting were silenced um, and then in in a different on a different kind of note i think it's 
sometimes it's very hard to properly understand what survivors are saying because we've got so many myths in our society um, and so many completely false ways of understanding rape and sexual violence that even when people think they are listening, they're actually not. Um, yeah, I could go on, but I don't want to take it too <laughs> No, you can go on. Um, at a staff level, yeah. do you feel that this conversation is happening? Because it is happening among students. Yeah, um, to some extent. Uh, there are the usual suspects having the conversation, um, mm. to put it quite bluntly. Um, yeah, so, and, and whether those those staff members actually have the kind of position to themselves be heard yeah. is debatable. Um, a lot of us are younger <clears throat> um, or in queer bodies or marginalized bodies. And so even when those staff members are having the conversation, it sometimes doesn't translate into moving up, up to like council, senate, mm. those kinds of levels. Management has reiterated that um, the protests need to happen within bounds of the law. Mm. And do you think that this is a good idea to like um, deal with the sexual violence here on campus? I mean, the thing about the law, the thing that we need to have a conversation about it is how the law in and of itself and the constitution isn't always morally like just isn't mm -hmm. always something that's just and so it's very difficult to in try to enforce the law when an injustice is being you know mm -hmm. acted on you and then you're trying to act in terms of the bound in you know so i think the law in and of itself failed survivors and victims of sexual violence so trying to have something that with a system that works against you is, is trying to ask people to work with a system that works against them is a very difficult mm. thing to ask of people. Mm. Mm. Dr. Lindsay Kellen, do you feel the same way? Do you share the same sentiments? And there's two, two things that are kind of being spoken about here, right? Protesting within the bounds of the law. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I think that what people understand as being within the bounds of the law differs, right? So even last year when the interdict was being fought in court, in the high court, um, some of the attorneys and advocates present were saying that some of the things that were listed as unlawful activities on the interdict were lawful, yeah. right? So there's confusion there around what constitutes lawful, what constitutes unlawful, and mm. I think that that does become a little bit confusing. Um, I've also heard from a lot of students that... This idea of, of the kind of, you know, peaceful picket yeah. um, isn't going to get the voices heard, right? So there's some kind of, there's a lot of frustration there with being told, this is how you can protest, right? And then thinking, well, if that's a acceptable form of protest, is, is that actually going to make any mm. difference, right? Mm. Is anyone going to sit up and listen in that case, right? So, mm. so that I think is is complicated and confusing for a lot of people in itself. And what you were bringing up was this idea of the law itself failing survivors, yeah. right? Our conviction rates being yeah. so low, the kind of secondary traumatization that survivors go through when they have to report at the police station and go through these medical procedures yeah. and those kinds of things. Um, and so the, those are two different kinds of topics, but they interestingly come together, right? Yeah. Because during the protest last year, we heard a lot about how, you know, you want us, you keep bringing up the law and wanting us to work within the confines of the law, but the law is, uh, yeah. is failing us, right? So there's a tension there, yes. um, and I think that the student protesters are really feeling that tension. I, um, also, I also think that, like, in terms of protest now, there's, like, a difference between um, a violent protest and a disruptive one. Mm. And protests in and of themselves are supposed to be disruptive. Mm. Uh, like by the nature and definition of a protest, it's supposed yeah. to be disruptive. Otherwise, it's like not efficient at all. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is that it's protests that have been happening on campus have been labeled as violent and unlawful, but they were merely disruptive, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a different conversation in and of itself as well. Mm -hmm. Hence why the protest last year went as viral as it did, yeah. because they had to go to the extent of actually stripping their clothes off. Um, but now, what do you think students and student leaders can do to 
raise awareness about issues of rape going forward? Do you want to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. I think what's really important at this stage is for us to all think about the ways in which we are complicit in perpetuating the culture, right? Because the culture itself is coming out of this kind of heteronormative, patriarchal ideology, which is itself systemic in our societies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the very ways that we think, the norms that we hold, the values that we've probably internalized without even reflecting on them through being socialized in this, in this way, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, you often, when you do try and have conversations um, in predominantly um, male spaces, you often get this not all men response. Yeah. People don't want to, yeah. like, people don't want to look at how they themselves are complicit in perpetuating yeah. the culture, mm. right? And we all are. This was Audrey Lord's point about looking inside and trying to find the, the piece of the oppressor planted within each of us, right? Mm. I think that's really profound because often when these things become systemic, it's all of us, right, that are, that are keeping this thing going, that are supporting it. Mm. It's not as though our rapists are, 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 you know, alien people or strange people that crawl out of the swamps at night and then disappear. No, you yeah. know, they're us, right? Mm. So we need to be thinking about our complicity, and I think that's what, so those kinds of conversations need to be happening. Okay. Um, thank you for your opinions and your thoughts and your ideas, actually. And um, you can follow up on the story on the Are You Referenceless page on Facebook. Also, you could look at the hashtag Are You Referenceless 2.0 on Twitter. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Kwezi Bovula. Good night. Audio